Now that we understand carbocations and how they can rearrange, let's look at the E1 elimination reaction again, where we had our alcohols and we reacted them with sulfuric acid, uh, and the dehydration of, that, of those alcohols formed alkenes as products. So here I have an alcohol, and let's see if we can classify this alcohol as primary, secondary, or tertiary. So this is the carbon that we're concerned about, the carbon that's direct that's directly bonded to the OH. Well, that carbon is directly bonded to two other carbons, so we call this a secondary alcohol. So this is a secondary alcohol. So it's very, it's just like how we did it with carbocations. And secondary alcohols, rearrangements are possible in the mechanism if you get a carbocation, because you would get a secondary carbocation in the mechanism, and secondary carbocations can can rearrange to form tertiary carbocations. So that's why a tertiary alcohol does not have any rearrangement, uh, so no rearrangement, because a tertiary carbocation would, would, would form, which is the most stable one that we talked about. And primary alcohols would be the slowest reaction, and if you had one of these, the carbocation would always rearrange into something more stable. So here, let's go back to our secondary alcohol here, so rearrangement is possible in the mechanism. Let's take a look at the mechanism and let's see the, the rearrangement that is possible here. So sulfuric acid is going to give us protons in our solution, right? So let's go ahead and put a proton here and one of the lone pairs of electrons on the oxygen is going to take up that proton. So an acid-base reaction, and let's go ahead and draw the product. Right, so we have our oxygen here. One of those lone pairs of oxygen did not react. Right, the other lone pair formed a new bond with that hydrogen, with that proton, and then it already had a high hydrogen on it like that. And then we have our two methyl groups. So formal charges, right, the oxygen, the oxygen actually has a formal charge of plus one right now. So if you if you do your formal charges, you will see oxygen is plus one. Oxygen does not like to have a plus one formal charge. That means it's it's electron deficient. So the electrons in this bond are actually going to kick off onto the oxygen, and we're going to lose water in this dehydration step. So let's go ahead and get some more room here, and let's let's draw what happens. Right. So we're going to lose water, so let's go ahead and draw water floating off here, so water is going to go away, and so water had, this oxygen had one lone pair of electrons, it got one more after the electrons in that bond broke, and let's go ahead and draw what is left, right, we have a cyclohexane ring, we had our two methyl groups, and this carbon right here lost a bond to that oxygen, so if it lost a bond, it's going to have a plus one formal charge on it. All right, so we have a carbocation. What kind of carbocation do we have? That carbon is directly bonded to two other carbons, so that's a secondary carbocation. And a secondary carbocation, if it's possible to rearrange to form a tertiary carbocation, it will. And we actually have that situation here. We can have a methyl shift, right? One of these methyl groups over here on the right can shift over to form a new bond to that carbon. So let's go ahead and draw what happens after the methyl shift, right? So now we have our our cyclohexane ring, and that methyl group shifted over here to this carbon. And then there was a methyl group already on the carbon on the right, right here. Now what happened to the formal charge? Well, the carbon up here at the top, it just had a methyl shift, and it already had a hydrogen connected to it, right? There was already a hydrogen connected to it right there. And it was this carbon over here on the right that lost a bond, right? So that carbon over there used to have four bonds, and now only has three three, therefore it has a positive one formal charge. So the formal charge moved from the top carbon to the carbon on the right after the methyl shift. So now we have a carbocation, and let's see if we can classify this carbocation, right? This carbon is connected to one, two, three other carbons, so it is tertiary. So the methyl shift gave us a tertiary carbocation, which we know is more stable than a secondary carbocation. So in this case, we definitely will have a rearrangement. In the last step of the mechanism, we need to form our alkene. So we need a base to come along. And let's see, the lone pair of electrons on this water could act as a base, right? Take just the proton, and then that would move these electrons in here 
to form our double bond and to get rid of that positive one formal charge on our carbocation. So let's draw the resulting alkene, right? So we have a methyl group here, we have a methyl group here, and the double bond is going to form right in here like that, and that is our product, a tetra-substituted alkene via a tertiary carbocation. So this is our major product, right? This is our major product. And the reason why this is the major product is the tertiary carbocation is the most stable out of the ones that we discussed. Let's see if we can follow some electrons, right? So let's follow some electrons through this mechanism to help us a little bit more. So in the first step here, let's see, in the first step, let's say these two electrons right here, those are the ones that formed a new bond with that proton. So the, those two electrons are these two electrons. It's all about following your electrons in mechanisms. The next electrons we need to follow would be the electrons, let's see, the ones right in here, right? The ones in this bond. Those are the ones that moved off onto the oxygen. So I could say that could be these electrons right here, right? So those could be the electrons. All right, what about, what about the electrons over here in our methyl shift, right? These are the electrons involved in our methyl shift. So that is the methyl group that went to here, right? That's the one that, that moved. And then in the last bit of electrons that we need to follow, let's see, there would be these electrons right in here, the electrons in that bond. Those are the ones that are going to form our alkene right over here like that. So there you go. Follow your electrons in your mechanisms. Think about rearrangements whenever a carbocation is present in your mechanism. Let's do, let's do another example of a rearrangement. All right, so let's look at let's look at this reaction here. So we'll start off with this alcohol. And the first thing we should think to ourselves is let's classify this alcohol as primary, secondary, or tertiary. So the carbon directly bonded to the oxygen is this carbon. That carbon is directly bonded to one other carbon. So this is a primary alcohol. And if we go back up here to our chart, right, a primary alcohol is going to primary alcohols always rearranged when you get your carbocation. That's because they form primary carbocations. So let's go back up here and let's go back down here and let's let's check out the rearrangement on this guy. So again, reaction of alcohols with sulfuric acid. So there are protons in here and a lone pair of electrons on the oxygen is going to take that proton. So in our first acid base reaction, let's see what we would get. Right, we protonate the oxygen, right? So there's one lone pair of electrons that's left behind. This is the lone pair of electrons that formed the bond with our hydrogen, like that. And this gives our oxygen a plus one formal charge, right? Our oxygen is now positively charged, which doesn't make oxygen happy. So in order to get rid of that plus one charge, the bond between this carbon right here and this oxygen is going to break. And those electrons are going to move out onto that oxygen, like that. So what would we get if that happens? So we have four carbons like that, and then our water molecule floated away. So here's our water molecule like that. It now has two lone pairs of electrons. And where is our positive formal charge? Where did it go? Well, it's going to end up on this carbon, because this is the carbon that lost a bond, right? This is the carbon that lost a bond to that oxygen. So this is our carbocation. And this carbocation is, of course, primary, right? Because that carbon's bonded to to one other carbon. So a primary carbocation is not very stable at all. So it is going to undergo a rearrangement. And what kind of a rearrangement could this carbocation undergo? Well, I know I have some hydrogens here uh, right next door to that carbocation. And so I could get a hydride shift here. I could get a hydride shift. I could get I could get this hydrogen and this and these two electrons are going to bond with that carbon. So let's see, what would we get? So what we get if we get a hydride shift in this case. So I have my four carbons. And I, I moved one of my hydrogens over here like that. And now there's only one hydrogen right here. Now there's only one hydrogen right here. And to start with, we, we already had two hydrogens on this carbon, right? We had two hydrogens on this carbon, right? We can go back up here and double check, right? This is that carbon that had two hydrogens on it. So this is our setup now. And where did that positive one formal charge go? It moved to this carbon, because this carbon has only three bonds to it now. So this is our carbocation. What kind of a carbocation is this? Well, this carbon is directly connected 
connected to two other carbons, which means it's a secondary carbocation. So a secondary carbocation is, is more stable than a primary carbocation, as we saw in the last video. So now we have a secondary carbocation, and there are actually three different products that we're going to make from this secondary carbocation. So to avoid confusion, let me just redraw that carbocation, and we'll, and we'll draw it three times, and we'll try to show the three different products that will result. Okay, so if I have a secondary carbocation, here it is. Okay, so I'm just going to redraw that secondary carbocation three times. So let's go ahead and get some more room here. So three possible products. Here's a, here are my three different situations. Okay, so in the first situation, one possibility is I could have, let's see, I could have, uh, let's see, I could have these two hydrogens right here. Right next door to that carbocation. Well, your your base could come along, right? Your your water molecule. So I'll just be I'll just draw a generic base here, just to avoid confusion. So I'll draw a base, right, with a lone pair of electrons. That base is going to take, right, this hydrogen, and those electrons are going to move in here to form your double bond, right? So the one possible product would be the double bond forms. Uh, between these two carbons like that. So that is one of your products, right? So that would be that would be trans two butenes. Let's go ahead and write that trans two butene is one possible product. Well, I know that I know that if I form trans two butene, I'm thinking about stereoisomers, I think cis two butene could form. And how would it do that? Remember, single bonds are sigma bonds and have free rotation. So I could actually get free rotation about this bond right here, and that would make my molecule look more like this. Right? And now I know that Right, I know that I have some hydrogens over here on this carbon, right? Some hydrogens here and here. And so if a base came along, right, I can just, you know, let's draw another base in here. That base could take that base could take one of these protons, right, and move these electrons in here. And that would form your cis compound, right? So that would be cis two butene. So trans two butene, cis two butene. And then one more possible product. Well, the other thing that could happen is uh, instead of going to the left side of my carbocation to find my beta hydrogen, I could go to the right side of my carbocation to find my beta hydrogen. And there are three of them that are right here after that hydride shift. So in this case, I could just have a base come along, and that base could take this proton, and these electrons can move in here. And this would give me a yet another product, another possible product with a double bond in the first position, right? So I could make one butene like this. And so you're going to get a mixture of three different products. Which one of these three is going to be the major product? Well. I know that disubstituted alkenes are more stable than monosubstituted alkenes. And if I look down here, I know one butene is actually my monosubstituted alkene. So this is going to be the, uh, the one that you find in the lowest percentage. Okay, So approximately 12% is one butene. So here I have two disubstituted butene, two disubstituted alkenes. And we know that the trans one is more stable than the cis due to decreased steric hindrance. So the trans stereoisomer is going to be the major product of this reaction approximately 56%, and then cis-2-butene is going to be approximately 32%, and those would be your three products resulting from this reaction. So one of the reasons why organic chemistry is so hard for a lot of people is because all the different steps which involve serious logical thought draw out the mechanism and if you understand the mechanism and you understand carbocations and you understand shifts, you can do these problems even though they might seem very difficult at first.